Memorial, a Region 24 educational event. I am Aaron Highworn, your Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas Regional Coordinator and your host for this evening. Tutorials are a, a local events in response to requests from folks for some educational material and tutoring. In upcoming tutorials, we'll be looking at bird identification and atlasing techniques. As part of the formal atlas launch in the weekend of April 24th and 25th, some workshops are being planned, so please keep an eye on the atlas webpage and of course, our local Facebook group for, uh, for more information. This evening, however, we'll be hearing from two experienced observers as they share their thoughts on one of the keys to atlasing in general and birding in particular, that's recognizing habitat and bird behavior. It really is a huge topic and one that cannot be thoroughly covered in the limited time that we're gonna have together this evening. Moreover, there's some healthy, and I might add deliberate overlap between this week's topic and next week's tutorial on identification. And in many ways, they're the same topic. So as you listen to our guests this evening, please bear in mind that recognizing and understanding habitat is important. It's key to understanding if a bird might be moving through, socializing, foraging, or indeed breeding. Our guests are gonna tell a few stories and show you all a number of maps and that we hope you're gonna find them instructive and pique your interest while also providing you with another piece of your atlasing and birding tool chest. Our intent is to keep things light and informative and leave plenty of time for your questions. The success of the tutorial, however, rests on your participation and engagement, so please feel free to join in. I'll be helped again this evening by Vince Fison, who will keep an eye on questions and, via video and on the chat. And uh, I'd like to now introduce Alex Stone. He's our first guest, and since the tender age of seven, Alex Stone has been identifying birds by sight, and at age eight, he was identifying blackbirds, dunnocks, and robins by ear, all in a posh British accent. Terrified by the outdoors and scary sounds from the large woodlands in the Ottawa region, he went forth and he tracked down each sound, whether it was a cardinal, squirrel, or unfriendly dog. He owes a lot to mentorship programs and outings led by the Ottawa birding community. Special thanks to Tony Beck, Bernie Ladasseur, and Rob Lee in particular. Since his first professional biologist training with the Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas, he has worked for five full seasons across Canada with Environment Canada and Birds Canada, conducting hundreds of point counts in the Northwest Territories, Northern Alberta, the Prairie Region, and the Maritimes. He's also worked with the University of uh, Alberta doing quality control for acoustic bird recordings. He received the Elizabeth Legate Award with the NCC for the successful and first ever relocation of a killdeer nest. The eggs hatched, just in time to miss the Foo Fighters, Dave Matthews Band, and Jethro Tull. Currently, he's a species at risk specialist working to protect reptiles in the national capital region. But before we hear from Alex, let's hear from Bernie. Bernie Ladeseur started birding because there were no dinosaurs or African mammals in his neighborhood and planets were hard to get to. A gift of binoculars for Christmas, followed by a trip to the McSkimming Outdoor Education Center where he saw his first evening gross beaks in, am I allowed to say this, Bernie, 1969, accelerated the process. And in the mid 70s, he became a member of the last edition of the Ottawa Birding Bike Gang. Since then, he has done some more useful birding activities, such as participating in now three Ontario breeding bird atlases, two Quebec breeding bird atlases, and breeding bird surveys. He's also a board member of the Ottawa Bird Count, which gathers and provides data for breeding birds in the Ottawa urban area, and is the compiler of the Ottawa Gatineau Christmas Bird Count. So Bernie, the floor is yours. Over to you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I think we'll just uh, get right into it. Uh, I'll see if I can share a screen. 
the way I want to share a screen. There we go. First off, can you guys hear me? Who are you referring to? Who are you? Paul here. Yep, can you we can hear, hear you. When, I, when I say something? Yeah, yes, we can. We okay, can hear you, Paul. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. People seeing my screen? Yep. Good. Okay, I'll bring it up to. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. So let me just get myself out of here. Okay, so I'm going to actually focus a bit more on distribution, but it, it has everything to do with, with habitat. Um, I'm just going to do some contrast of the first and second atlas and sort of some, some of the trends here. And uh, when you're actually going back and, and looking at maybe prior records and so on, uh, you uh, may not always want to take things at face value looking at that at uh, the previous atlas records but you can access these on the on the atlas site uh, and see uh, and get and and bring up species maps for the first and second atlas and so those are very useful tools just to give you kind of an overview of of your uh, uh, of of uh, uh, of of your square perhaps and and maybe adjacent squares or whatever when you're when you're actually working or if you happen to be in a, somebody else's square and you just want to know uh, you know what's available well, here's an interesting species. When I was uh, young, uh, I mean, this bird really didn't breed in the, start to breed in, the, in, in Ottawa until really the late 60s. And, uh, and, and it was really an urban bird. And it was just uh, during the first atlas that it started to uh, take off. And you, you can see here uh, in the first atlas on the right-hand side, there's a big gap between the birds along Lake Ontario and and the birds further north uh, and it it took them a while to actually kind of get a a, a toehold in in the, in the area and a lot of it was just due to climate and i think after a while we we bred uh, a stronger cardinal so so these were this was the case in the early 80s and that's just when uh cardinals really started to explode in our area but it kept going and in the early 2000s during the second atlas, you can see it filled in the areas in between. I suspect strongly if you were to go in and look at, uh, you know, if we were to catch some of these cardinals and do a, a DNA analysis or whatever, that these birds are more likely emanated from the Ottawa population rather than the, than the, um, the Great Lakes area, just because I, I believe we, we bred a stronger cardinal in a way. And so, in the well, it was urban feeders that kept them alive in the first atlas here. Now we see kind of the, this whole fill in, and now it's hard to go into a rural woodlot and not not get cardinals. So this is this is a change from so in a sense a habitat change from at least a very local perspective. It would be something you wouldn't expect to encounter in the a country when I was younger, but now certainly uh, certainly that is a change. You have other birds that, it, you know, this is an introduced species. I mean, native to the western part of the, the, uh, the, the continent, but introduced in New York City, kind of that area, and, and expanded uh, northward. And you can see uh, the first atlas just barely, just they were just bar barely starting to, the first record in Ottawa is 1977. So this, you can see they're just getting uh, kind of uh, established. And now you can see the big, the big fill in that happens and, and the, the, the population actually peaked. I, I think we might find that there, there might be some gaps now when we, uh, when we, uh, uh, when like not every area would, will, will have house finches, but that, that is something for us to discover in the house line, uh, in the, uh, on the Atlas. But uh, with this, it's, um, you know, we really consider this an urban bird by and large so if you're out in the country and you can see all these squares are filled in, well, I keep hitting my mouse the wrong way. Um, it's probably small towns and, and villages that have them, not, you know, you're probably not going to find them in, you're not gonna find them in, you know, uh, mixed forests or whatever to, to that extent. So within, within these, 
each one of these squares, which are 10 by 10 kilometers, uh, it, it's going to be in the villages and in the, in the towns that you're likely to find this bird. So that's interesting. You have other things that have happened over time, uh, kind of, uh, and it's hard to figure out explanations for these, but one possibility may be just, uh, you know, the planting of trees in, in areas that didn't have trees before. So the habitat will change over time. Uh, succession, kind of a succession type of thing. Uh, fields of farms that aren't being farmed anymore. Uh, trees that were small in the first atlas that become larger in the second atlas. And so this is, and then there's just other conditions, maybe food and so on, why, why birds, uh, 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 you know, expand their range. But as you can see here in the Eastern Ontario, uh, just, there's just a few spots where it would be uh, a, uh, a, uh, a nesting in the first atlas. It was a very rare breeder in the area. And now uh, in the second atlas, they started to pop up in different places. So here's an interesting habitat problem, an identification problem, and two on I mean, blue-headed vireo. We uh, we've al always had yellow-throated vireo as a as a rare breeder, uh, but their habitats may overlap in some areas. But in, in there's certain areas, well, you know, if it's uh, you know if it's a coniferous forest or whatever, a mixed forest or whatever. Uh, well, a mixed forest, then then you may not know which one you're dealing with, you know, but mature deciduous forest, it's going to likely be a yellow-throated vireo. In, and the problem here is, even though their songs are distinctive normally, they do sing each other's songs. It's really just the raspiness, come, uh, it, there's, a, there's a raspiness to the yellow-throated vireo songs, very hoarse sounding bird like a scarlet tanager or a purple martin or something that kind of hoarse sound where it's kind of a more like a, a mimid type of call for you know like a, a mockingbird or something like that the quality of the voice i'm not talking about the the, the song uh they they, they kind of have like a red-eyed vireo type tempo to them but but uh there's that absence of rapsiness or uh, uh, the raspiness or the hoarseness in the blue-headed vireo song but I've heard like a blue-headed vireo singing and said, here's a blue-headed vireo leading a group and put a scope on it. And there's the yellow-throated vireo uh, looking at it. So it's something to be aware of, but habitat can be uh, a key. And, uh, and, uh, and if, if you're uh, not certain, then it's, it, it would behoove you to, to track the, the bird down somehow or whatever. So, so the, but this may be just a case of, of some, uh, some trees growing larger, new, new plantation. And here's a good thing to know too. It's good to know the difference between, you may not know all your habitats. Like I'm not a habitat expert, but it, it, there's some basics you should learn, like the difference between a pine and a spruce. That would be, that's a very uh, a critical thing to, if you can learn how to uh, tell those trees, about, to know what an aspen or a pop, poplar is. All those white trees out there are not birches. So, you know, that's the thing. And that, and, you know, those are softer wood trees, uh, deciduous trees, they're going to have a different species, often have different species than, let's say, really, really hardwood uh, type of uh, deciduous forests. Here's another example, kind of a really, sh this blank space over here in eastern Ontario. When, when I was younger, yellow-bellied sapsucker was a migrant through Ottawa. Now, they bred and got apart. They weren't far away, but it was just a migrant bird. And look at how they filled in in the second atlas. Now, are those just forests growing up and so on? Well, you know, what, what was the gap? And so, I mean, this is kind of like the cornfield, the corn belt area or whatever, where, uh, where, where they were absent. So things, things, as I said, things do change. Some birds uh, expand uh, for, and all, all expansions aren't necessarily, I mean, we kind of think of, expansion and things like global warming and birds that are moving uh, northward, you know, post, post, you know, glacial expansion or whatever, all that kind of stuff, all these birds. But there are species that have, have expanded from the south. Um, um, uh, and that would be uh, birds such as common raven. They've, they've expanded southward. Canada goose, uh, merlin, and some of this might be just things like hunting pressure on, on Canada geese and introduction into uh, populations into cities and stuff like that that have changed, uh, 
you know, how, how we treat Canada geese and, and they've ended up expanding greatly. Geese are expanding, all geese seem to be expanding all over the world right now. And, and, uh, and common raven, uh, you know, they were, I, I don't know how our forefathers treated uh, common raven, probably not the same way we do. So they've uh, expanded southward in the east anyway, they go well south in the west and have for a long, long time. So, so this is, this is a species that's now become, you know, a, a very uh, regular part of, of our, our, uh, um, you, you know, you know, our, So we're gonna, you're gonna have these situations where, you know, fields, uh, farm fields become fields that are left fallow and then start growing small brushes. And so, um, and, and, and then smaller trees become bigger trees. So all these kind of things, and then trees get burnt down, land gets cleared, all sort of type of things will, will change uh, the bird life that's going to be found in those particular areas. But you can see here is an amazing thing. This, this happened in the, in the mid, mid to late 90s where Merlin started to move and started breeding in, in uh, more southern areas. And whether it's related or not, we have kestrels here where you can see now in the second atlas, there's some areas where they're gone for, uh, they, they've gone from and, and Merlin's have become an, an urban nester uh, in, in our area. Uh, Mer kestrels used to be an urban nester in our area. They used to overwinter quite often in our area. Uh, they don't, it's hard, really hard to find an American kestrel in the wintertime where we have Merlins that do overwinter in our area. So, so here's, here's another thing's changed, but you know, different, different nesting habits though. Uh, you know, one nesting in conifers and, and, you know, more of a proper nest, the other more of a cabin, you know, a kestrel's more in a cavity nester. So when birds decline, sometimes they start getting picky about their habitat, meaning they've got They've got a choice of, uh, they've got a choice of the the prime habitat. They don't have to make do with something else because uh, they're an abundant species and, and there's high competition for the best areas. So kestrels probably now you're probably get, going to be out into that kind of kind of often that kind of useless farmland land that doesn't grow stuff very well. That that kind of things that may have a species like grasshopper sparrow in it so that so that area that you find might find like oh this is going to be a boring square well not necessarily it won't necessarily be a boring square sometimes there's some really different species there that will will make it uh, uh really uh kind of not so run of the mill if you know what i mean you're you're looking for there's a whole new suite of species uh to, to look for in that area and that would be uh, you know, something uh, Alex will go through, maybe some of the specifics on that. But here's a species that seems to be declining, disappearing from the, from the area. Now, is this just fields getting bigger? Uh, I mean, the plants getting bigger in the fields and no longer are they these short grass areas and areas with mullen. And now you've got, you know, smaller trees that grow up and field spirals like to use them. And then still they get a little bigger and maybe clay colored spirals like to use them and so on, that kind of stuff. So this kind of succession that happens. But certainly this would be a species we're, we're really be interested in focusing in on. And so, so some of these, uh, these grassland areas are, are where we're going to uh, want to be really paying particular attention to a bird like grasshopper sparrow or upland sandpiper or something, you know, birds along those lines. A bird that would use kind of the same habitat quite often would be a loggerhead shrike. As you can see a lot, we had kind of a, a lot more breeding birds back in the early 80s, uh, in a lot of areas with, with breeding loggerhead shrikes. And you can see they've disappeared from quite a bit of areas. This doesn't even tell nearly the whole picture though. Uh, uh, this, these populations in Ontario are, are so disjunct from the rest of the population of loggerhead shrikes now. It's not, you're not gonna cross over the border and then just find them getting more common or whatever, no, virtually absent. And so these, these are really kind of 
uh, kind of birds taking their last stand in, the, in this area. So it would be in that type of habit that you might have a loggerhead shrike. If you do find a loggerhead shrike though, uh, I would uh, uh, ask you, we would all ask you, don't put it in the e-bird right away. Um, talk, to, uh, talk to Aaron. Uh, about uh, where uh, that uh, you, that you that you found a loggerhead shrike, uh, we we're probably even going to delay putting it into the atlas as well. So this is a special case where, uh, uh, if, especially if they're breeding, we don't uh, we don't want them to be disturbed, and we want them to to have success. So that's an example. But I do recall though. Uh, uh, just to tell you a story how one thing can lead to another we were uh, in this kind of cornfield area as i like to call the corn belt and we were helping helping somebody with her square trying to to find you know augment some of the species here and uh but she'd found a, a loggerhead shrike nest this is back in the year in 1984 and uh we were and there was a juvenile and we were kind of admiring it sitting there and when, uh, when, uh, while we were looking at it, I heard this bird singing off in the distance. And it was a northern mockingbird of singing way. Uh, still a rare bird in the area. And this brings up kind of another principle here. You can see on this map that these yellow spots, these are new locations for mockingbird. And then there's these old, locations for mockingbirds. And what's the difference between these these areas before and after? I would say probably not a whole lot, really. It's just a rare bird in the area. It, it so it won't necessarily use the same uh the same uh you know if it's got a, a pick of a pick of habitat here, it don't necessarily expect it to be where it was last year or the year before or the year before that. However, there is a small population in the area, so look for suitable habitat uh, that might support mockingbird and, and you may you, you, you know you, you may encounter one here, which as we did on the on this particular trip. And so uh, so a couple of stories from that one was then once we went and found the mockingbird, we were at then the edge of this kind uh, this isolated grove of trees, and that's where we found a red-headed woodpecker. So, uh, so this kind of exploration came. So the you know the mo and this is perfect. It was perfect spot for a red-headed woodpecker at the time, and and uh, it, and so this is what can happen on your atlas is 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 uh, exploration leads you to some areas. Now, one thing about this was on private land. We had permission and so on. This is, it's important to get permission, but the, often in these, the, uh, I think uh, Alex is going to talk about the back 40 of, of farmers' fields, some gold mines for for uh, for species uh, there. So that would that would be uh, yeah. So an interesting another interesting tidbit though. Sometimes they do come back in the same place. Well, there was a loggerhead shrike survey between the two atlases that we were doing, specifically looking for loggerhead shrike because the bird was declining drastically and we went back to some of the old locations. And so when we went back to this area uh, looking for loggerhead shrikes, unfortunately we did not find loggerhead shrike, but there was a mockingbird singing uh, again. So uh, that, that, was, uh, that was kind of interesting. Here's a, I bring up morning warbler. It's just kind of a bird that, he, you know, you may look, it's, it's going to be very low density, let's say out in the corn belt or whatever, but you, you think, yeah, you, you think there's just no way a bird like that would be out here, but you get these micro habitats and uh, Alex is going to refer to these micro, these small little areas that are suitable habitat. And in the, those, in, when, when you look for these different habitats within a much larger, you know, uh, area uh, of of the same habitat, you, you're going to find different species. Now, you may not find the whole suite of birds that you would find if this were an extensive area, and not just a micro habitat. But in those micro habitats, you may find some unique. Uh, yeah, some well, you're definitely going to find different birds than than that the surrounding habitat, but at the same time, 
uh, you, you may find some of those birds that are specific to that habitat, even though, even if it's only uh, some of the suite of species that you're likely to find here. And, and I find morning warbler, I was surprised the first atlas to find morning warbler, and even Canada warblers in areas there where at first blush it just looked like, oh man, this is just one big cornfield <laughs> but there were there were all kinds of these little little areas that were uh you know that were good so open areas and woods when you're walking through like that can be that uh, and some of these isolated groves can have like black-throated green warbler and hood uh, wood thrush that, that type of that type of uh thing even though it's uh just um uh, as i said by and large maybe a, a flat area same thing with you know, you know further west in our region you know a lot of it's more shield like but you you will get these kind of kind of alvar or plain like areas that uh will, will harbor different species that are making use of that uh, uh that uh, the habitat and of course the the whole thing with towns and stuff like that will obviously bring about different you know yield different species i want to bring lincoln spiral up here so i just want to bring it up as you can see the uh, here you've got a couple of areas, the, the uh, Mare Bleu and the Alfred Bog. Okay, this is, so uh, this is an over-reported species uh, in the, in when, when you've got uh, juvenile birds and the birds in the same genus, such as uh, song sparrows and swamp sparrows, they can re look remarkably like Lincoln Sparrow. This is where habitat becomes really key here. Uh, and even then within those habitats, you've got to worry about both those species, song sparrow and, 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 link, and, uh, and swamp sparrow uh, to, to a certain extent. And of course, song sparrows are everywhere. Uh, it's, it, in our region, this species requires like a very specific habitat. And, uh, uh, you know, Lincoln sparrow is going to be a bird that reviewers are going to scrutinize a, a great deal. So. Uh, that would be one thing that's just a cautionary tale when it comes to certain species here and uh, it, it, it is often uh, a misidentified young song or swamp sparrow that's been uh, been encountered as so there's where knowing the habitat can be uh, a critical critical clue some species have just declined now you might come up with all side of flycatcher reasons well maybe not as much, you know, you know, you know, better control of fires, and uh, you know, all that kind of, uh, uh, the, you know, not not having these stands of dead trees or beaver ponds or whatever, but there just seems to be a general decline anyway. So, uh, just because the birds are seeding, they, they still may make use of. Uh, you can still get isolated birds that uh, are disjunct from from the rest of the population that make. Uh, that that will uh, uh, make use of, of suitable habitat in their area, but in our situation, there's probably going to be many you know many areas that look perfect for an olive sided fellow catcher, but they just won't be there. So, um, and here we go. And so for this atlas, you you wonder what will happen next. And here's here are two species that we've had uh maybe unprecedented numbers of these birds overwintering uh uh you know uh, being found here in the winter red-bellied woodpecker and carolina wren uh this would certainly be a species that would be you know pretty these two species pretty well absent for the most part from our areas but one might predict that that as the atlas progresses that we are going to start finding uh Squ uh, them in squares where they were never found before. So, uh, so this is where a recommendation is that when you're going, let's say on eBird, you may look and find out where some of these observations are or have been in the last 10 years of certain species. See if any have been in your square or a square that you're going to cover. See if, uh, you know, check out host spots to see, you know, bar graphs for certain species during the breeding season, let's say June and July, see if they, uh, you know, they've been found there. And then if you can hone in more on the habitat actually within, uh, you know, where those, where those specific sightings are found, like you can find certain locations, well, where did they find that bird? So, so these are, 
these are some tools that we have. Aaron's going to go through some other tools, but that would be an example of how to how to use eBird and maybe use some uh, be able to anticipate and look and be aware of some of the species that you might find and where within a square or whatever that uh, that they might occur. There's other things too. You know, you can check habitat at different times of day. Here's an example. Now, how am I supposed to do this again? I've got to. Uh, to get the video going, just sh uh, share the audio. I got to share the audio. Is it down? Where is it? Or do I have to stop share and go back into Zoom? Uh, um, uh, stop I'm going to stop share. Stop share and then restart your stop share. There you go. Okay. Do I do that before I restart my st start share? I or click on start share. Or share screen. Share screen. Oh, there. Share sound. Bottom yeah. left. Okay. And then, okay. Share. So uh, I want to see if people can hear this. You might have to listen very hard. Are people hearing it? I'm seeing nodding heads. Okay, so you get the idea there. And that's uh, that's a Cedren, of course. And, and you can see it's a very soft song. So sometimes visiting a habitat maybe at night or in the evening or well before dawn, before robins and stuff start speaking may make it easier to hear certain species like Cedren, uh, you know, especially if it's calling from a distance or uh, Lee Spittern, a bird like that, or some of the, they used to be Amadramus sparrows, now they're it's been split, right? <laughs> but anyway, those type of sparrows, uh, you know, so, some of the Leconte sparrows in, in, in Ottawa have been found like singing at two o'clock in the morning. That's how they've been found because they're not drowned up by everything. Walking into Richmond Fen, you know, heard Nelson sparrows singing, grasshopper sparrows will sing at night, uh, Hensel sparrows. If you're going to find a Hensel sparrow, well, there's, you know, that type of thing. Upland sandpipers have heard it. So, Sometimes, you know, certain, like, especially some of the grassland and marsh areas, sometimes returning uh, when things are a little quieter to see if something else is, is singing there. And, and you can be primed for certain species, uh, you know, uh, in, and, and uh, you know, when you visit these areas. Often low returns, but sometimes very, very worth it. So, and then you might just discover an area, like I had the, uh, the pleasure of doing uh, 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 back in the first atlas in 19 in 1983 I guess I was uh, I made my first I was late starting I guess I ended up with Carp Ridge and it was pour, a day pouring rain it was June 13th and uh, I had no idea what the square had now we've done uh, three atlas we're doing in our third atlas maybe they're not too many secrets but as i said habitat changes over time but this was a a case where the first bird as just we were just climbing up on the ridge i rolled down the window it was in the rain and the first bird i heard was a cerulean warbler so and <laughs> so we got out of the car and we we tracked the bird down, make sure, and everybody got to see a cerulean warbler for the next week or whatever. So that bird did not breed there. It ended up being just on territory uh, and then disappeared after a while. But still, that kind of shows you uh, what can happen. And uh, But what happened then, the next stop, we heard a pine warbler. Now, pine warblers are, are, are a lot more common than they used to be, but we were pretty excited to, to find a pine warbler singing. And then the next stop with it was golden wing warbler and eastern towhee. Now, how many of you have gone to Carp Ridge to get your eastern towhee and golden wing warbler? 
for Ottawa. So many of you have. Well, that's when it was discovered. It was discovered during the Atlas. It was because, you know, we, we, this is where we decided instead of doing run of the mill stuff, we actually discovered a new area. And, and so doubtless new spots for birds are going to be discovered uh, on, on this Atlas. And then here's something uh, which we didn't discover on the Atlas, but it's just for your entertainment. But nevertheless, on the Carp Ridge, you, you, you think of, man, this looks good for prairie warbler. Well, if it looks good for a species, don't necessarily, if you didn't get it there in year one, don't write it off in year two, year three, year four, year five, you might get it there. Hence those sparrows seem to show up in the same areas around the Maribou, 20 years apart, as in the same with Louisiana water thrush, the same trail, 20 years apart in Gatineau Park. So there are some, if, if the habitat looks good for a species, you know, uh, it's, it's always worth checking here. So this is just for your entertainment and also to maybe embarrass some other people. Anyway, there you go. Is. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking maybe 250 is actually doable this year. Weather make or break. Yeah. Nice. So, just a little tease there, but uh, the um, but uh, yes. So, Carp Ridge has also yielded prairie warbler, not in the atlas, but maybe it will this atlas again. So, anyway, that's uh, all I have to say. I don't know if there are questions, or do we want to go straight into Alex? We don't have any questions in the chat, but um, one I can think of, Bernie, um, if you're going to pick one species that, that you think might breed here that's not just totally new species that hasn't bred in the region before, which one would you, would you pick for this atlas? That has never bred here before? Oh. Or, yeah, it's never bred here before. Oh boy. I might, ha might have to give that some thought. Yeah, that's never bred here before because well, I wonder if tufted titmouse might be uh, something to look for, uh, you know, by the end of the atlas. Uh, that might be a species that, uh, that, uh, that, where it could happen. You heard it here first. No pressure, everybody. <laughs> Go find your tufted titmice. <laughs> have, have we had trumpeter swan? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, in the region. Yeah. Okay, Alex, floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, Thank you, Bernie. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Alex. I'm hoping to do a habitat primer for those people that are new to Atlas or are interested in learning about new habitats in the in the Ottawa region or why do we have such ver such variation in our habitats here in uh, in Ottawa? So uh, this is sort of what I do um, during the summer. I'll go out to various areas around around Canada and do some surveys. I'm quite bedraggled in in this photo. It was raining for a while, but I love the the northern environment. I love working in the boreal. It's uh, it's a beautiful area, and we do have some boreal habitat here in here in Ottawa. Um, so what I'll do is I'll often go out into the bush and on the left hand uh, screen you can see all my equipment that I use. So I have uh, this for this project I was using a song meter where I, I would record the, the birds that were singing during my point count and then I would also write them down at the same time and then later on during the summer I would actually listen to those recordings and mark down any birds that I may have missed on my point count. And I found out that I was actually pretty accurate. I was accurate to about 70 to 80 percent, which is which is which is quite good. I really love that area, um, especially in, in the bogs here. And then on the right, I've got an example of a topo map. So every day we would generally figure out where we're going to go and would map out our routes. So um, you know, a lot of pre-planning forewarns you. Uh, for this project, we had different habitats laid out in uh, in a topo area. 
uh, scale is roughly uh, one kilometer is one square. And so we were really looking for um, different habitats in the in the, the lines that you see there, 47 to 52, that's route one. And that's because we're targeting burn sites. So, so these are areas where you'd see a lot of, a lot of burns. Um, and we were really looking for uh, all of sided flycatcher, hawk owls, things like that, that might, that might show up there. From the sky, you can kind of see the difference between uh, what it looks like on a topo map. It's a lot more messier um, in, in real life. But uh, the topo maps give you a good approximation of, of, of where you want to go. So Bernie did a great job in, in looking at the different ecosystems that we had. So in his uh, blue-headed vireo slide, for instance, you could see that the, uh, that the boreal shield, the, the area outlined in green, and the mixedwood plains are quite separate. And that's because of the geological history of, of Ottawa. It's a remnant of the, the Champlain Sea, and we've also got the St. Lawrence uh, lowland ecosystem, which is great for growing corn and, and, and having a you know, really nice flat area for, for agriculture. And then we've got the Boreal Shield, which is typically higher elevation, more familiar with the uh, Boreal Forest. And, uh, Ottawa is great. We've got lots of microclimates here too. So we've got uh, some boreal habitats like Maribula. We've got the river ecosystems like the, the Ottawa Valley. We've got very flat areas um, that are used for, for agriculture. And uh, we've also got stuff that's more southern. So um, not quite shagbark hickory here, but uh, they may be coming up as, as climate change pushes the trees further north. And I find that in really, really interesting. So, um, yeah. So for agricultural landscape here, uh, we've got a lot of soy and crop corn production. They're great for all our, all our geese that are moving through right now. We've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of geese that move through Ottawa every, every year. And we've got, uh, lots of uh, forage crops. So these are areas where are cleared for largely for cattle and horse horses. Um, uh, that's for their feed production. And then we've also got pasture. Often you'll find birds like this. This is a, a, a nice male bobolink. He's sitting up on a nice milkweed stalk and he's singing his R2D2 song. Uh, they'll often uh, hang out on, the, on these perches. And then what they'll do is they'll fly up and they'll do a little R2D2 call and they'll spiral down and then they'll land very close to the same spot that they, they started from. And that's how they display to females. So you can see the bird, but also you don't have to identify it if you hear the R2D2 song and the, uh, and the behavior of the bird. So that's a good trick. And bird communities also kind of will give you an indication of what birds could be there. For instance, uh, in, a, in a forage crop situation, you might have uh, eastern meadowlark, which is a declining species, bobolink, grasshopper sparrow, savannah sparrow, song sparrow. You could have goldfinches, barn swallows flying around. You might get very, very lucky in the wet forage areas. There's a couple around Ottawa. You might be able to hear a sedge wren, which Bernie uh, gave us the sound for. And you never know, uh, there could be a short-eared owl around. Um, what else? Uh, doing a lot of work in the prairies in Saskatchewan, sometimes we'd come across these little pockets of five or six short-eared owls that would be, be, be in a field and, uh, and nothing further. Uh, they're really neat if you do find a nest. Uh, they're quite large. Uh, short-eared owls are quite aggressive. And I even saw one try to take out a golden eagle that was flying over top in the prairie. So uh, that was a really neat experience. Uh, it was the middle of the day and this golden eagle had no idea what was over top of him. And I was quite scared for the owl because goldens are quite a powerful creature. So, um, you know, in a forage you'll often find hay or alfalfa or timothy or, or other plants. But uh, in more pastured areas, so these are areas that are, you know, actively being used for uh, for uh, cows and horses, you'll often see kind of brownhead cowbirds. Eastern bluebirds might be on the wire, uh, looking for places to nest in, in boxes. Eurasian starlings, common grackles, house sparrows. 
And uh, if you're lucky, um, you might be able to look out for upland sandpipers. They often sit up on posts um, and they look quite different from Wilson's snipe, which also do the same thing. So whenever I put up my binoculars, I never know what species I'm gonna really see. Uh, if it's got a small head and a huge body, it's usually an upland sandpiper. And if it's got a really long bill and you know, a reasonable size head, then, then it's usually a, a Wilson snipe. Um, other things you can find are, are, are mockingbirds uh, and even nighthawks. They'll also sit up on the posts. They'll, they'll roost at night and sometimes they'll, they'll sleep there. Um, I think in Peely last year, they had, you know, three different goat suckers. They had Nighthawk, Whippoorwill, and Chuckwill's Widow, um, you know, and all of them liked sort of these, the, these open spaces to, to hang out in. Another bird is, is loggerhead shrike. We, we talked about it quite a bit. Uh, who knows, they, they, they could be up there. So here's kind of a picture. It's not pasture. This is more of a forage field, but I was out there last night. And as you can see, there's, you know, some, there's a barn in the back. There's a few lines of woodland in there. I was out there last night and I found a great horned owl nest in one of those lines of trees. Um, I was really excited about, I look forward to going out there um, in a few, uh, in a few days to see if there's any nests in there yet. Uh, corn and soy are actually quite boring. Um, I find you can mostly bird them from the, from the, from the road. Um, I've spent way too much time listening to birds in cornfields, uh, especially out west. Uh, a lot of, a lot of soy crop, uh, it's, uh, and uh, canola seed. I would only get four species. Generally I'd get Vesper, uh, clay colored and Western meadowlark. And I'd be super bored because in bogs you can get upwards of 40 species uh, in a point count, so. Yeah, uh, so we talked a lot about the back 40 woodlots. Now a lot of people are going to have them in their in their squares. Um, these are areas of, of woods that are, are separate from agricultural production and they're very, very vibrant. Um, you never know what you can find. Uh, for instance, Eastern Whippoorwill. That's a, that's a declining species and they actually require open areas and uh, forested areas. They tend to nest in forests. I've only come across one bird, one whippoorwill nest, and uh, I was surveying an area. A uh, farmer wanted to build uh, a house for his uh, son, and I was out there doing bird surveys to see uh, whether or not he could uh, for any kind of endangered species. And I saw this bird do a broken wing display. And when birds do a broken wing display, you can really tell that there's a, a nest nearby. This time, usually it's killdeer. That you'll see, but this time it was uh, a whippoorwill that was doing a broken wing display. It was extremely cool to see. Um, I didn't want to disturb it too much, but uh, the farmer just thought it was a robin, but I was, uh, I was happy that it was something much rarer. And you never know what you can get in these, in these woodlots. Uh, Red-headed woodpecker, uh, eastern wood peewee, um, you know, they're, they're super vibrant. Red-shirted hawk is another one, black and white warbler. They're really nice. And what do these look like from, from the air? Um, well, you can kind of see here, you've got farm fields all around and you've got a couple of, um, a couple of wooded areas around here. So, um, you know, I really like stopping off on the side of the road, uh, not, not trespassing, but, but listening out or, or trying to hear new things. In Ottawa, we're really lucky. We've got the Ottawa River. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful landscape, and it's something that everyone can enjoy. Everyone can can, can look out along a pathway or, you know, Petrie Island, Shirley's Bay, and uh, you never know what you can find. This was taken uh, doing lease barren surveys across the National Capital Commission, uh, National Capital Region. I did a lot of work uh, looking out for these guys in, in, along the Ottawa River. Uh, Vincent Bison and I found uh, a lot of breeding pairs. I think we found around 10 or 11 breeding pairs, most of which were in Shirley's Bay uh, and Stony Swamp and Mer Bleu. And uh, we could really tell uh, where they were because we could identify the bird community that was, that would tell us that, you know, there would likely be a least bittern here. 
So, uh, for instance, marsh wren. There's a strong correlation between the habitat of marsh wren and an least bittern. So, if you hear a marsh wren, you might have a least bittern. But the issue with least bittern is that they only call 15 or 20 percent of the time, even if you know that they're nesting nearby. So that's why it's 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 quite critical to really go back to a place and get to know it. Um, and you know, after two or three or four site visits, you might even be able to hear one. Black tern is also another uh, declining species. Um, you know, they used to be very very reasonably common in in Ontario. Unfortunately, they've undergone steep declines. Um, one. Uh, one area where they used to be common was Petrie Island, but uh, they're no longer nesting there. They might be nesting across the, in the middle of the river on, on the Quebec side, but um, they're a bird that's that's quite interesting to, to find because you'll also find um, multiples there too. So there is actually a uh, there is a function on the on the app when you are doing it that you can kind of tell how many. Uh, individuals you, you come across that, that have are actively breeding in the area. So I, shot, I thought I'd show a couple of uh, interesting pictures. Um, this is uh, a nice red-winged blackbird sitting up on a, on a cattail. And on the right, we've got a nice, uh, nice least bittern that's doing its classic splits. Um, you can also tell least bittern by the, their behavior too. Um, they are rarely fly. And they'll often sit on on cattails, so they're kind of suspended. They're rarely actually in the water themselves, but they're kind of making their way, gripping onto cattails as they as they move through the bush. This is a, a black tern colony that I found near Camden Lake, and uh, it's now one of the only places to find to find black terns. So I ended up driving a couple of hours to go see this. Uh, these birds here, and uh, I find them really stunning. So when you're atlasing, you'll find a lot of different uh, colonial nesting birds. So in Ottawa, sometimes we'll have uh, heronries that have, you know, your usual great blue heron or great egret. Sometimes you'll have a black horn night heron in there, and sometimes, very rarely, you'll even see a white cheek poking out of a heron nest. And that's a Canada goose that has just taken over the nest. It's kicked everybody out and it just wants to nest there and they'll just, they'll just sit there, um, which is kind of funny. Um, Aaron has this really interesting story about a mallard that nested in a flower box in the middle of downtown Ottawa. Um, I hope you guys to show that, that, that picture. Um, and so when you're out listening, you never know, you could be downtown and pick up something really cool, or you could uh, be at a heronry and spot a Canada goose in a, in a heron nest, which is pretty lazy of the goose, to be honest. And then along the river too, we've got gull colonies, we've got ring-billed gulls. Uh, we've got one of the largest populations of ring gull actually in the world, uh, along the, the Dacian uh, important bear, bird area. Um, common terns can, can nest in the area and uh, you know we've, we're seeing more and more Caspian terns along the Ottawa River as far as our prior now so you never know if that could be a new a new bird and of course double-crested cormorants nest in these in these colonies too. One of my uh, most one of the ecosystems I'm most interested in is uh, is the silver maple forest it's uh, it's a declining ecosystem um, across uh, um, across Canada. What they require is they require to be flooded out periodically throughout the the year, so they don't have any competition. And they're one of the few trees that can actually survive being submerged for significant amounts of time. There's a couple of good um, demonstration uh, sites of of silver maple. I found that Peachy Island, um, Greens Creek, uh, the entrance there, and Shirley's Bay are really good, uh, uh, really good examples of it. And you never know, um, well, well, you know, you know what's going to be in there, but you know, you could find interesting things. I found brown creeper breeding there. I don't often find them around Ottawa. They've got a really high pitched, high pitched sound that you have to key into. And then you've got northern water thrush. That's quite. Uh, that's quite uh, aggressive sounding. Um, 
And then you've got Eastern Word Peewee, which is another declining species. And uh, you never know when you come across uh, a screech owl even calling during the day. Um, I believe that's our, 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 our local one at, at Britannia. Um, I took a photo of him uh, a few years ago. A few other habitats that we have around here are our wetlands, uh, wet spots and puddles. Uh, this is a wetland feature just in the south of Ottawa, opposite the Fallowfield bus station. And uh, it's, it's a really great site. I found uh, Northern Shrike here during the winter. During the summer, it's full of yellow warblers and, and American goldfinches. And so we're kind of lucky that we have such diverse habitats around, around the city of Ottawa. Here's a picture again I took of a, of a creek system here. Um, you can see the cattails either side of it, uh, some sumac. Uh, you know, you never know what you can expect in these areas too. Yeah, Virginia rail, um, Sora, and uh, Swamp Sparrow tend to hang out in these spots. So um, there's a lot of, you know, interesting niches around people's, uh, people's squares. This kind of shows a bit more of the transition. So um, it really helps to know your trees uh, when you're in sort of different environments. Uh, in this area here, we've got um, We've got uh, a little bit of white spruce, you cedar, white birch, and a few trees around. So um, I identify the habitats based on trees, but Bernie identifies it by, by birds that are around. So that's how uh, he, ident he helps identify his trees. <laughs> and uh, another important area is the urban transitions. So um, Ottawa is quite an urbanized environment. We've got a suburban environment too. Uh, that has a lot of green space, recreational parks, things like that. So, um, you know, Bernie showed some increases. You can, you'll often hear the the kick, 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 kick of, of Merlins that are around. They'll be nesting in your jack pine or your big pine tree that's behind your house. Um, they'll wake you up during, during the night. They're super noisy that they, they're up at 4.30 every day. And when they have juveniles, they'll, they'll let you know all about it. Uh, for at least three or four hours. It's a great alarm clock, but if you don't have to work on the same day, it's pretty brutal. Uh, what's really been interesting is seeing the shift in uh, different hawks that are around the city. Uh, Cooper's hawks have, have moved in a lot. I would say, you know, 70% or 80% of the hawks that I see around Ottawa are, are Cooper's hawk with very, very few sharp shooting hawks around. Um, so if you do find a sharp shinned hawk, that's, uh, that's a great observation. Another couple of our, our more urban uh, environments, we've had a common night hawk that can nest uh, on the top of buildings downtown, and they can also nest on, on, on their ground. Uh, they're a declining species that's, that's having some trouble. Most insect eating birds are, are, are having these issues. Uh, we've seen a big uptick in, in peregrine falcon observations uh, this, throughout the, these years. And, uh, you know, I already talked about the mallard in the, in the cup, but you can also see uh, wood ducks and, and Canada goose nesting in there. And they're quite aggressive. So around Ottawa, I think we've got around 60 or 70 different forest types. Um, I could talk till about 11 p.m. tonight about each different different type, but uh, predominantly around Ottawa, we've got sort of maple, beech, oak, and ash uh, forests. Uh, ash borer has taken out a ton of ash trees around Ottawa, and um, that's even led to a rise in woodpecker populations, as seen by kind of our, our Christmas bird count trends and, and things like that. Um, so the woodpeckers have been feasting on, on either the dead wood and that's, that's here or the ash borer itself. Um, we've also, uh, we've kind of transitioned further south, say Amherst Island, those kind of areas. We have Shagberg Hickory Maple Forests. We also have those in, in Montreal. Not so much in Ottawa. You have to go further south to, to see them and that's Shagberg Hickory is where you're going to find you know, the, the slightly uh, more southern species of, of red-bellied woodpecker. Maybe that's a bird that uh, we might find breeding uh, this year too. 
Yellow birch, eastern hemlock forests, very, very cool forests. And that's where I find most of my barred owls uh, in, this, in, this, in this northern type environment. It's, it's the type of forest you'll see at, uh, if you're ever on the gondola at um, uh, Camp Fortune, that's, that's a lot of uh, yellow birch habitat there. A lot of them got nose too. Um, around Bruce Pit, for instance, we've got sort of a white pine, sort of what I call an ultimate forest. We've got a super canopy. So these are white pines that are, you know, 100 feet tall, 120 feet tall. And um, that's sort of what, you know, we think uh, Canada looked like or Ontario looked like um, before, uh, before colonial times. And then we've got white spruce, balsam fir, uh, northern mixed forest. In woodland, woodland thickets, you can see kind of different things too. Uh, Canada warbler, winter wren, yellow warbler, hermit thrush, veery, magnolia warbler, and common yellow throat are all interesting species that you can see in, in, in dense, dense understory. It's usually, it's usually quite wet. Um, but you can even see that, you know, the Canada warbler sitting in a, in a balsam fir. You never know when you'll come across a little yellow warbler. Uh, I find finding their nests are, are, are quite fun. And as we sort of make our way further north, we can, we can see uh, sort of uh, Lincoln sparrows in these, uh, in, in these bogs. So there's various bogs around, around Ottawa and sort of Ottawa's transitioning into more, more of a boreal feel when you go up to the Rose Forest. So you can, all, you can sometimes find uh, these guys, uh, King May warblers. That can sh that can show up. So um, you know, I hope that we've uh, we've talked a lot about different habitats and different bird communities. Um, I didn't talk very much about different woodlands and, and different and different types like that because there are about fifty different kinds, and, and each bird community is is subtly different. Um, next uh, next tutorial, um, we're going to talk a bit more about bird behavior. And so uh, this picture is off some, some interesting bird behavior. We've got a uh, great horned owl uh, sitting in a tree in the prairie. And then we've got a brown thrasher that is absolutely not happy with this owl. Brown thrasher is sitting on the, on the left in, in the dead branch. And uh, you know, sometimes you can tell if they're, they're agitated, if there's a nest around. So I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. Thank you uh, very much, Alex. Um, so before we go to questions, and I, I know there are a couple that are uh, uh, in the queue, I want to share something with everybody that follows on in hot pursuit, as it were, of the two presentations. So Alex, if you could uh, end your share screen, and I'm gonna put something on very quickly here. I'm slowly learning how to use you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oops. The wonders of modern tech. Here we go. Rare. Okay. So um, on the Atlas website, if you go to um, resources atlas square resources once you're signed in you'll be brought to this standard map that allows you to find your square you can enter your square number or you can zoom in and once you get there you remember i explained to to folks uh this particular view that shows your uh, square you might be located in various point counts the orange uh, waypoints are ebert hotspots this first map has been updated uh, within the past month and it's a useful tool. Alex and Bernie both talked about habitats. Look at what we've got on this particular map. Bird studies, uh, Birds Canada has put together updated topo maps and they show you the various habitats in a particular square as well as the percentage. So here's just a zoom. If you look at a particular square here, it'll tell you what percent of the square is broadly forest matching the color code shrubland matching the color code wetlands etc cetera, etc cetera. so a really useful tool to uh to have a look at so once again 
Atlas Square resources, zoom to a square, first document there on the right hand side, the PDF map, and away you go. So I'm going to stop there. Um, Vince, I believe we have some questions. Yeah, we have at least one for Alex about um, for identifying different habitat types based on the vegetation. Do you have any good resources to learn your trees or your other plants? Um, any species besides birds, essentially? Um, I found uh, I found that uh, iNaturalist has actually been a big help for me for identifying my trees and, and plants. Um, often I'll look for leaves on the ground and and use the seek function to uh, to help me identify uh, trees or plants. It's great because it identifies it for you. Um, there's also a couple of really good books out there. Uh, the Newcomb's Guide to Wildflowers is 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 one of my bibles whenever I'm out in the field. It, it really helps. And um, the other the other one is the Outerfield Naturalist Club and uh, other clubs that that take you out. I know that in Gatineau Park there was a couple of tree identification courses so uh, those resources can can really help. And uh, one, one more question for you Alex. Um, which habitat type has the most mosquitoes? <laughs> so after being out for a long long time I can tell you that there's a few habitat types that uh, do have a ton of mosquitoes. Um, often the northern bogs can be quite bad um, but I have found the worst sites to be not in wetlands like you would predict, but actually in beech maple forests in Ottawa. I found them to be quite bad and uh, I often run away from them whenever I'm there. Um, but unfortunately that's where the scarlet tanagers are. So um, I got to take a photo of them. So I got to somehow figure out how to cover my hands with gloves. Yeah, I was joking uh, when we were preparing for this with, and Alex just referred to that when, when it comes uh, just to ha finding habitat, identifying trees and so on. Um, as I said, I kind of did it, started doing it in reverse. I, I'd, uh, I'd identify all the birds and I say, well, there must be those trees, that, you know, sort of, I learned it backwards, in, in other words, and I haven't learned it completely anyway. So, uh, but uh, if you can just learn a few basics, and then after a while, you can just kind of look at an area and, and have an idea of what birds should be there. Or maybe one species sings like a winter wren or something, and you say, well, there might be these other species here. So you sort of, um, you can kind of learn, you can kind of learn it backwards that way. I, I, I remember walking through this spot with some friends one time and saying, this looks like a good place for woodcock. And I didn't know why, it just was sort of like an intuitive thing. And, and it's the heat of day in July. And moments later, we flushed a woodcock. And then a few more minutes later, we flushed another one. And it's just, so sometimes, you know, people learn in different ways. And so like, I, I don't think you have to go away and study for two years and know all your trees. Uh, and, and now with this new resource that Aaron pointed out to us, uh, some of it's done for us. Um. I noticed a question here from uh, from Jean, an observation, and uh, she's right. The uh, there's a bit of a trade-off in terms of the new maps versus the uh, uh, the maps that were used in Atlas II. The Atlas II maps had uh, perhaps better uh, rendition of contour lines. I'll look into whether or not those old Atlas II version maps are available. Uh, there are a number of uh, mapping resources uh, available. Uh, I don't know, Jean, if you're on the Facebook group. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion about uh, being able to convert square boundaries and uh, point counts onto your mobile phone. Um, and there's, uh, uh, if you're not on the Facebook group, maybe you could uh, message me through the Ottawa uh, at birdsontario.org uh, address and I'll, I'll link you up on that. Um, but I'll also have a look to see if uh, perhaps some of those older, uh, older topo maps uh, are available. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions? I've got everybody muted here, but uh, if you do have some questions, uh, please feel free. Uh, Manson, the sec there. Here we go. 
Okay, I've got it unmuted. Uh, <laughs> good, uh, a good series of tutorials. Uh, given the current situation where we're supposed to stay home, do you recommend us uh, staying home? <laughs> or, uh, you know, like right at the moment, there's not a lot we can be putting in as far as uh, habitat or singing mail and that kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's kind of going out there now into your sector, you're more or less exploring and finding all the Canada geese going through and the red winged blackbirds that are probably going to stay. But I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on going out given the or stay at home order. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent and very timely question. The uh, instructions, guidance from the Atlas on COVID are on the Atlas page. And uh, I'd encourage everybody to, to have a look. Uh, we're under a stay at home order. The stay at our home order has though some, um, uh, I won't call them loopholes because that's certainly not the right word, but we are permitted to get some exercise. We are permitted to go out. Golf is permitted. Um, at the same time, uh, if you find yourself in your neighborhood and you're walking around and you're blessed with some NCC properties, um, I believe the NCC is, is encouraging you to take advantage of them, be prudent, be safe, follow the guidelines, uh, but you know, don't go traveling across town to that NCC property, go to the one that's nearest to you. Uh, that certainly was what the NCC was saying here uh, in, the, in the last uh, situation. But I, I would take um, cues obviously from what the province and the municipality is telling you in terms of local orders, I'd follow them. Uh, and also have a look at what the guidance is uh, on, uh, on, on, the, on the website. Everybody has their own comfort level, but we also want to be safe. We want to get through this. And uh, I think everybody in the Atlas has recognized that this year has, has been hit hard by uh, the realities of COVID. So we want you to be safe. This is a five-year project, right? Yeah. So um, hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, Vince, do we have any other questions here? I'm doing no, a bit of no other questions. No other questions in the chat. Uh, one comment that Western Chorus Frog Survey people said it's um, that I guess you can go out to do the surveys under the uh, the research. So I'm not maybe it's similar for the breeding bird or the uh, Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. Unsure. I I, I believe that's a volunteer effort that's being led by uh, any wildlife federation or, or other organizations. So um, that's just a separate group from, from what the Alice is doing. And, I see, well, go ahead. Oh, I just say, yeah, and Sheila has a question about um, breeding codes. So if you see a bird carrying nesting material, what code should we put it under? That's a good question. and. We'll do a bit of fine tuning on that in the fourth tutorial. So that's my teaser, you know, tune in in two weeks time for the tutorial on uh, uh, atlasing and some of the codes to use. Uh, in that situation, uh, that sounds like confirmed breeding to me. It sounds like nest, nest building. Uh, the definition of the code uh, NB is nest building, including the carrying of nesting by material by all species except wrens and woodpeckers. I found it uh, interesting uh, submitting my great horned owl observation. The fact that uh, the app says that it's uh, bird bird entering nest, so it's not quite sitting on the nest, but it's entering the nest. But that's why I put my uh, my nesting as uh, yep. in in the atlas. So uh, Sheila, that was me giving you a thumbs up. There, you're welcome. <laughs> Do we have any other questions, comments, observations? Anybody want to chime in? Okay. Um, I want to uh, just do one last check here with Vince. I think we're, we're going to wrap things up here. I want to thank our two guests, Bernie Ladisseau and Alex Stone, for taking the time to share their thoughts with us this evening. It's, uh, they covered a lot of ground. Uh, it's a fascinating aspect of atlasing and, of course, birding. And we hope that armed with these insights, you'll be looking at and for birds just a little differently. 
I would also like to invite you to make plans to participate in our next tutorial on bird identification with Adam Smith and Tony Beck on Wednesday, April 14th at seven o'clock. Details will be available soon. And uh, on that note, I want you all to have a great evening and please be safe. Good night. Good night.